Through his time on the Dream SMP, Carl Jacobs has shown himself as one of the most entertaining and friendly people on the server. But the adventures he was about to go on, and the things he would discover about himself, would put into question everything he thought he knew. This is the story of Carl's Tales from the SMP. Really quick, I want to thank Carl for letting me use the official builds from Tails for this video. These crazy shots really wouldn't have been possible without them. Also, we are literally a few thousand subs away from a million. I don't ask for this often, but if you could take a second to subscribe, it would help me more than you know. Plus, I may or may not have something crazy planned for the 1 mil special. Thank you, and enjoy the video. Carl woke up in shock at what he'd just seen. Where was he? Who were those people? And when did those events happen? It couldn't have been a dream. Everything felt so... real. Almost like the universe tried to correct itself, and he found himself caught in the middle. He wished he could live through it again, warn the people of what was about to happen, rewrite their story. That was it. Carl knew what he had to do. He made his way past the ruins of Lemanberg to the perfect spot, and began construction. And after some mining, crafting, and building, Carl's library was finally complete. And although he still wasn't sure what happened that day, something about it felt supernatural. Like he was always destined to live that moment, always destined to remember. And so, he made his way inside the library and wrote the story of the village that went mad. He placed this story in an item frame on the wall and headed outside, wondering what other stories the future or past may hold, and when he would travel to next. This time when he woke up, he wasn't alone. Three fishermen had found him in the back of their cabin, and were just as confused as him about what was going on. They introduced themselves as Benjamin, Charles, and Cletus, and before long, the three befriended Carl, who looked quite different and decided to go by Isaac, and invited him upstairs to their dock to go fishing. As he made his way up, Carl noticed a strange book on the ground and picked it up to see what it said. It told a tale of a long lost city beneath the water, a place filled with history, stories passed from generation to generation. But, the book explained, the residents of this great city had disappeared. Had they just moved to a new home, or did something much darker consume the people of this long lost world? The book didn't say, but what it did say was more than enough to convince them to try and find out. And so, struck by wonder, the four adventurers entered their boats and set out to find the fabled city. And after following the book's directions into the middle of the ocean, it wasn't long before they found something. Immediately, the four exited their boats and began to explore the structure. Quickly, Benjamin found a lever and used it to open the locked door at the center of the room. Behind this door was yet another book, confirming that they were in fact directly above the city of Mizu. They looked around. Excitement filling their eyes as Charles flicked yet another lever, opening a secret door in the wall. And as the four adventurers descended down the ladder, they found themselves enclosed by the glass walls of Mizu. But they weren't alone. A strange man, or whatever he was, introduced himself to the group as Rambob. 
he looked familiar to Carl, but he couldn't quite remember why. The four introduced themselves and agreed to take a tour of the city from Rambob, who was very happy to see some new faces after so long being alone. As the group descended even farther into the city, concern grew over the amount of blood covering the ground. But when Rambob was questioned, he reasoned it was just from the food. The four were still a bit suspicious, but regardless decided to continue exploring the wondrous city. The overall design of the city, Rambob explained, was great, but the real magic that made the city famous was its themed rooms. Each one of these rooms was based on a historic figure from the past. Rulers of kingdoms, fearless warriors and noble leaders, from a time long before now. Carl looked long and hard at these heroes. He didn't know how, but he already knew their stories. He listened to Rambob's tales with a strange feeling of nostalgia, like he was rereading a book he never knew existed. The Disc War, Lamanberg, it all seemed so close, yet so far away. They continued to roam the ancient halls of the long lost city, until they had arrived at the Tree Dome. Fishermen marveled at the sight that lie before them, branches reaching from the sea floor to the glass ceiling above. It was perfect. And in their fit of amazement, somehow Rambob had disappeared. Confused, the four began to search for him around the room, quickly discovering a secret room key. The group had no idea what or where this secret room could be, but upon spotting a chest at the top of the tree, Benjamin was sure that whatever was inside would tell them exactly what they needed to know. And it wasn't long before the four decided to send Cletus to climb the tree and see what was inside the chest. But as he began to climb, something went very, very wrong. Meeting him at the top of the tree was Rambob, who explained to him that nobody who comes to Mizu ever gets out alive. The blood the mysterious disappearing of the people, it all made sense. Cletus, through a mix of fear and confusion, was just barely able to snatch the book from the chest before being consumed by the raging fire. Quickly, Benjamin ran over to the base of the tree, catching the book just as Rambob began to light off TNT. The three ran as fast as they could, shutting the door behind them to slow Rambob down and stop the wave of rushing water. They hid in the skeppy themed room, which had a clear view of the now flooded tree dome and opened the book to see what it said. First, it instructed them to head back through the main hall and place the key on the block that didn't quite fit in to open the door to the secret room. And second, it informed them that this secret room was in fact their best bet at making it out alive. They knew Rambob was already roaming the halls searching for them and they had to act quickly. And so the three ran as fast as they could down the main hall opening the secret doorway and descending even further into the depths of the city. There, they were met with yet another locked door, along with a lava-filled parkour room, which clearly had another key at the end. They knew it was only a matter of time before Rambob would find them, and with their backs against the wall, they would have nowhere to run. Someone had to cross the parkour. Being a self-proclaimed professional parkour person, Benjamin volunteered and began to carefully traverse the pool of lava. Platform by platform, he made his way to the last jump, but upon landing on the last platform, his foot slipped and Benjamin fell into the pit of lava. Carl and Charles were devastated, but they didn't have time to mourn. And right away, Carl decided he would try it next. And this time, he didn't slip. And after jumping as far as he could, barely making it back over the lava, the two adventurers placed the key and opened the door to the final room. And of all the themed rooms in this strange city, this one felt different. Much stranger, too dark, and powerful to reside upstairs with the others. And as they marveled at the strange green and black walls, they heard something enter the room behind them. Rainbob! Everybody here had an idol that they worshipped. Is yours and mine was dream. <laughs> yeah. Nobody 
leaves here. Oh! No! 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 Charles! Charles! No! Carl woke up paralyzed, like he'd seen himself die in a dream. But this time, he knew it was real. He rushed back up to the library and began jotting down the stories he had been told. The stories of his friends, wars he fought in, nations he helped build. He told in great detail the wonders of the strange lost city, and the friends he made along the way. But he noticed something else this time. During his adventure, he had failed to recognize that the idols of the lost city were his friends. And even now, he felt like he was losing memories he'd sworn to never forget. And the person he was before these strange adventures suddenly felt much farther away. He was frightened by this feeling, but realizing there wasn't much more he could do now, he tried his best to remember. And so, he began writing a personal journal alongside the logs of his adventures. This way, he'd be able to track his feelings after each trip, and hopefully learn more about what was happening to him. And as he made his way outside the library, he decided to move on and go about his life on the SMP, wondering where and when he would travel to next. This time, Carl woke to find himself standing outside an extraordinary mansion. He'd never seen anything like it. Glowing in the warm, clear afternoon, it looked like the house of an angel. But if one thing's for certain, the owner of this mansion, Sir Billiam, was no angel. Carl made his way to the front door, and was immediately greeted by Sir Billiam and his butler. After bragging about his immense wealth, he told Carl that he was hosting a masquerade. And still having no clue why he was there, Carl just decided to play along. Together, the three took a tour of the home. Priceless paintings covered the walls, a dining table as big as a room, and bedrooms fit for a king. Before long, the other guests began to arrive. One by one, they stepped through the grand entrance and into the golden light of the chandelier. All over, Lord Sebastian, James, and Liaria. And um, whoever this guy is, right away, the group distanced themselves from this strange man and entered the grand ballroom to begin the party of a lifetime. But little did they know, hidden deep underneath the tranquility and magnificence of the mansion was a dark secret that was about to endanger the lives of everyone within its walls. Just minutes later, as the guests engaged in friendly conversation, well, mostly friendly, the lights suddenly cut. Terrified, the people ran as fast as they could, hoping to find safety in the endless maze of halls until the lights jolted back on, and the guests, still shaken up from the event, met by the entrance of the mansion to make sure everyone was okay. At first, it seemed unusually calm, until Sir Billiam realized the strange man was the only one missing. Convinced he was being robbed, he ordered everyone to split up and find the criminal before he escaped the mansion. But when Carl found the man, he quickly realized this was much worse than a robbery. This was a murder. The group panicked. They knew they had to figure out who the killer was before the lights cut again, or else they risk another guest being killed. Carl mentioned that he had stumbled across a secret passage before he found the body, and that the murderer could have used the secret passage to sneak up behind the poor man and take him out before using the passage to get away quickly. The group agreed and immediately turned their attention to the butler and Billiam, who were the only two people who would know about the secret passage. Billiam stated that he had built safe rooms throughout the mansion in case poor people broke in, and the butler just said that he saw nothing. The group was still unsure enough to make an official decision, and so they decided it would be best to look for more of these safe rooms in case the killer decided to strike again. Everyone went their separate ways, and as Carl was exploring the West Wing, the room went dark, and the killer hunted for their next victim. Carl sat in the corner of a bedroom hoping the killer would find someone else first, until he heard the sound of a sword directly below him. And as the lights came back on, he realized that he was just a few planks away 
from being the next victim. This time, the victim was Liaria. The group was devastated, and Carl demanded that the killer step forward immediately. The group once again suspected the butler, but Billiam stated that the two had been together the whole time. Having nothing, the group decided to check the area around the body for any secret passages. And before long, Carl found a path underneath the stack of barrels that led back to the ballroom. Carl reasoned that the murderer must have seen Liaria go through the secret tunnel before meeting her on the other side to kill her. And the one person who claimed to be inspecting the wine right outside the entrance to the tunnel was Sebastian. Carl ordered Sebastian to follow him through the tunnel alone, and facing the wrath of the rest of the group, he complied. But as the two entered the storage room, the lights went out yet again and right away, the two scrambled to find a place to hide. Making their way upstairs, Carl and Sebastian hurried into a bedroom and hid inside of the closet. Together, the two sat as still as possible, praying that the murderer choose another victim. Until... The lights jolted back on and Carl ran as fast as he could into the hall. There, he found Oliver, and quickly the rest of the group arrived outside of the room as well. After explaining what happened, Carl suggested they do the next blackout differently, splitting up into groups of two, so if anyone died, their partner would be guaranteed to be the killer. Everyone agreed, and since there was an uneven amount of people, Carl would go with Billiam, Oliver with James, and the butler would stay by himself. The pairs went their separate ways, with Carl and Billiam making their way to the west wing while Oliver and James stayed in the east. A few minutes later, the lights cut, and Carl and Billiam immediately searched for a place to hide. Finding a secret ladder in the closet of one of the bedrooms, the two descended into the small safe room to wait until the blackout was over. When the lights turned on, the two rushed up the ladder to see who had been killed. And upon exiting the closet, the two spotted Oliver on the bed and James's body on the ground across the room. At this point, it seemed clear that the killer was Oliver, but Oliver once again claimed his innocence, stating that the butler had done it. Still a bit unsure, Carl decided to buddy up both of the suspects for the next blackout. That way, whoever lived of the two would be revealed as the true killer, while he and Billiam stayed completely safe. Oliver was not very fond of the idea, but was told he would be executed for murder if he failed to comply. And so, the groups went their separate ways for the last time. And as the lights shut off and came back on, Carl and Billiam made their way to the entrance of the mansion to await the killer's arrival. And as they looked around to see if they could spot him, none other then the butler appeared from the other room. Carl and Billiam knew they had to run, as the killer had no reason not to kill them both. Billiam quickly led Carl into the library, through a secret entrance in a painting, and into his favorite room in the mansion. Right away, something felt off about this room. A dark feeling that seemed to grow stronger as Carl made his way farther into the room. Billiam explained that this room is home to something very special. This room is where he keeps the egg. Carl felt memories flooding back to him, the pain and manipulation the egg had caused to some of his best friends. Billiam explained how the egg demanded poor people for consumption, and that the egg was able to persuade the guests to take out each other one by one. Carl made a break for the door, but was immediately stopped by the butler who demanded he go back inside. Terrified, Carl nervously agreed and entered the room once again, and was guided towards the egg by Billy.
Something about this place felt familiar, but Carl couldn't seem to figure out what. A fleeting memory? A feeling of comfort? Or the strange half-consciousness of a dream? All he knew is what he saw. And at that very moment, what he saw was a strange book on the other side of the room. Walking towards the book, the faint echo of his footsteps rang through the silent air. Was he dead? Was this the afterlife? He opened the book and began to read. The book explained that this place is called the In-Between, and acts as a gateway for traveling in time. The book explained that the In-Between was a place of peace and ease, and held the secrets to understanding and controlling his abilities. He experienced feelings he'd never felt before, like he was living through memories he has yet to make. He continued farther into the castle, walking through the angelic halls until he found himself in the castle courtyard. There, he found another book, this one explaining that although he loses a bit of himself with each adventure, one day, through the power held within the castle walls, he could take control of his mind and end the mental decay for good. And finally, he continued exploring making his way upstairs to a spire overlooking the courtyard. And as he read yet another book, the unknown author warned him of the importance of keeping his abilities a secret, as well as the importance of his library, suggesting he move it to a much more peaceful land, somewhere well out of harm's way. And as he looked off into the endless void that lied in front of him, he felt the light grow brighter as the feeling of tranquility faded from his unguided soul. And as he found himself writing about everything he'd seen that day, he felt more confident than ever in his newfound purpose, and his duty to rewrite history and change the future for the better. The sun beat down from a cloudless sky, sand covered the ground, and a dirt road ran through the middle of what looked like an old western town. It was clear that Carl had traveled back to the Wild West. After hearing a noise coming from a nearby building, Carl made his way over to see what was going on. There, he witnessed a group of people calling themselves the Bandits, attempting to rob the bar. Hello? Well, yeah, yeah. We're in the middle or something. You might want to walk on out. I'm going to be honest. Our God. The thing that you're in the middle of seems a little mean. This guy says we're being mean. <laughs> he said we're being, we're being mean. mean. We? We're being mean. Yeah, all I, th right, I huh? think you are. Ooh. Listen really up, just, pal. I'm no. gonna give you one chance to give hey. me all your booze, all your money, yeah, and maybe, just maybe, I'll consider leaving your head alive for your mother to see. I'll leave him alone. You're still here. You're still here. Yeah, I am. I think you guys need to Get stop out, hurting my, my friend. Listen, mm -hmm. why are you dealing with this? Why are you just allowing them? Uh, I mean, what are the, what am I gonna do? I can't I can't shoot for anything. I mean, I don't, I have all my fingers, but they barely work. If I'm totally honest. Your fingers? Bro, hey, listen, I'm gonna be honest. Things. I don't specifically like you. We I have lots of guns, and we all know how to shoot. So I I think that you guys should leave. This guy's threatening us. This guy right here. Guess what, Nancy boy? There's a new sheriff in town. Oh. Yeah. You know what? Just know we'll be back. That's right. You don't intimidate us. You don't scare us. We'll be right back. And we'll be coming oh, back yeah. with our guns and ammo. Let's there. go, boys. As the bandits made their way out of the saloon, the bartender thanked Carl for his help and offered assistance with anything he needed. But Carl, knowing he must have been sent here to help this town, was not interested in payment. Rather, he knew it would only be a matter of time before the bandits returned. And the next time they showed up, they had to be ready to stop them. Carl started by asking to meet the other townspeople, to convince them to join the fight against the bandits. John agreed, and together, the two explored the town, looking for people to recruit. The town banker, Percy, who wanted revenge after the bandits killed his cat. The sheriff, Sherman, a week out from retirement looking for one final adventure. The town criminal, Crops, responsible for eating 12 whole people. 12 people! Ron Ronson, the town mailman, who seemed useless but could maybe be used as a human shield. And finally, the clerk, William Williamson, who was tired of being robbed by the bandits and wanted revenge. Together, the townspeople, united in their common hatred of the bandits, set out to prepare for their return, to take back their town. The first stop was the gun range, 
where the group gathered weapons and learned to shoot from the sheriff. And after a long day of recruiting and training, the group sat around a campfire at the edge of the town to discuss their plan of action. Carl reasoned that whenever the bandits arrive, they will most likely choose to settle things with an old-fashioned standoff. And so, the group decided that in the event of a standoff, their three bravest, Sheriff Sherman, Criminal Crops, and none other than the bartender John, would stand up against the bandits. And as fate would have it, as the sun began to peak over the horizon, the people heard the faint sound of horses trotting in the distance. And right away, they knew it was time to put an end to their troubles once and for all. Count me down, Sheriff. All right. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight, nine, shoot! We did it! Great, great shot. We did it! Where's his head? Where's his head? At last, he was back. He longed for the feeling of the in-between, the wonder, the safety, the freedom. At least, he thought so. He never knew how the books got there, or why they always seemed to be left like breadcrumbs of a trail he was destined to follow. But he followed them anyway. Their reassuring messages gave him the comfort they promised. But his illusion of solitude was beginning to wear off. He knew this wasn't a dream. Then what was it? Not a word was spoken, and yet, everything was clear. He followed himself down the hall to the courtyard, but as he stepped around the corner, the sight froze him where he stood. It was as if every timeline was being played on the same track, like he was living in every time at once. He spotted yet another book, and made his way to the center of the yard to read it. Once again, the book warned of what lied ahead, and if he didn't figure out how to control his memories, he would lose himself and everyone close to him. He looked to the future with fear. How much longer would it be before he forgot everything? Trapped in the never-ending loop of adventures he would write down and forget, a vessel of memories from every time and every life but his own. And for what? He needed to find a way to fix his mind before it was too late. And as of now, the in-between seemed like his only chance of doing that. But still, he felt something inside him fight back. Another side of his mind that wasn't so quick to trust this strange place. As he made his way out of the courtyard, he noticed something he'd never seen before. A small imperfection in the wall. As he moved closer to investigate, he found a book hidden inside. This one seemed different. Every other book lied directly in the path he was intended to follow. But this book, for some reason, was hidden. And Carl couldn't help but wonder if the book was hidden from him or something else inside the castle. It told him to look under the tree. Confused, Carl began searching around nearby trees for whatever the book was leading him to. Until he remembered a large tree just outside the main room and decided to check there. 
As he explored around the tree, nothing seemed to stand out. But upon looking closer, he found yet another hidden book tucked under one of its roots. But upon opening the book, Carl was completely caught off guard. He didn't know what to make of the strange message, and so he dropped the book and jumped back onto the path. Finally, he made his way to the island's edge, wondering if the in-between was really as good and as peaceful as it claimed. And as the sun gave an orange glow to the pale castle walls, Carl felt reality fading around him, before waking up again in his library. After his first visit to the in-between, Carl was told of the importance of moving his library to somewhere safe. The war-ridden grounds of Lemanberg were too close for something so important. And so, with his closest friends George and Sapnap, he traveled, far away from the Greater Dream SMP, to a land untouched by man. Because he couldn't just tell his friends about his abilities, he also couldn't just build the library. So instead, he decided to build a new nation. A new kingdom, built under peace and happiness, where him and his friends could live away from the chaos of the old world. But to build such a grand nation, the three needed more help. And so, Carl reached out to his friend and talented builder Foolish to help bring his dream alive. For months, the four built the kingdom from the ground up. A castle, a mushroom house, countless fountains and trees. And most importantly, Carl's new library. Kenoko Kingdom was finally complete. And as the three citizens of the nation, Carl, George, and Sapnap vowed to never let it suffer the same fate as Lemanberg, and to keep peace and prosperity for as long as they live. Carl woke to find himself in a strange house. Hearing talking from the other room, he made his way over and was immediately greeted by a familiar face, Connor Eats Pants. Carl was surprised to see someone he knew, and quickly realized it meant he didn't travel too far in time. Connor explained that him and his friends were just getting away for the weekend, and Carl was welcome to join. And after introducing himself to the group, and getting started with the party, everyone was surprised to hear a knock at the door. Connor was confused, as he hadn't planned on having any more guests. And so, he made his way to the door, only to find none other than Schlatt on the other side. Carl was shocked. The last time he'd seen Schlatt was the day he died. And now, in this strange adventure, they met once again. Schlatt explained that he was the owner of this house, as well as the one next door and that because the other house was empty, and Schlatt was feeling generous, he would allow them to switch from their small cabin to the next door, Grand Mansion. Excited about the offer, the group agreed and made their way down the trail outside, until they stopped. And looking up at what stood in front of them, the group was at a loss for words. The group entered the mansion in awe. Grand chandeliers hung from the ceiling, ancient statues lined the towering walls, and a mysterious structure stood in the middle of the room. But despite its magnificence, Carl couldn't seem to shake an eerie feeling that something was about to go horribly wrong. And just moments later, Schlatt demanded a volunteer. Confused, Connor took it upon himself to volunteer as the host of the party, and followed Schlatt to the back of the structure in the middle of the room. But by the time the rest of the group got there, Connor was gone. Schlatt stated that this entire mansion was built as a game, and if they wanted any chance of seeing Connor again, they would have to complete three trials, following each of the three main hallways and gathering the Nether Star at the end. But if they failed, Connor would be stuck in Schlatt's hidden lair forever. And after some deliberations and offers to trade people for Connor, the group accepted the challenge. And as they stared down the first hall, it was time for the Trials of the Haunted House to begin.
After countless challenges, teamwork, and the loss of some of the group's bravest, the remaining players stumbled back into the hall, holding the third and final Nether Star. They were relieved, until they realized Schlatt was right behind them, and having passed all three trials, Schlatt requested that Carl place the final star in the center of the structure. And ready to save his friends, Carl took a deep breath and placed the final star. The group moved carefully down the dark hall, wondering what they would find at the end of the path, until it reached a dead end, and the only way in was to jump. His friends, every last one of them, were dead. Until he noticed Connor next to him, who explained actually none of them were dead, they were just chilling in Schlatt's hot tub. And with a sigh of relief, Carl and the rest of his friends celebrated an amazing night, before Carl felt reality begin to slowly slip away. This is the in-between, a world you've been to a few times now. Fear not, this is not a place to provoke harm, but a place to feel at ease. But how much did he really believe it? This time the imperfections were clearer than ever. Had they always been there? Was he blinded by bliss, caged in oblivion by the illusion of utopia? Or was someone trying to talk to him? The first book urged him to find a way to the portal, and that it was more important than he knew. What or where this portal was? He didn't know, but he was too interested not to try and find out. He continued exploring the castle, crossing rooms and climbing stairs until he found it. Hidden at the top of the castle and locked behind bars was the portal. He wondered where it could lead, and more importantly, why the castle wanted him so desperately to stay. He longed for answers, and the more he thought about it, the more he believed those answers lie on the other side of that portal. But regardless, he continued to explore, this time unafraid of the imperfections. He noticed the books on the main path start to change, almost like they were trying to convince him of the beauty and magnificence of the castle. He looked upon the other travelers, wondering if they really knew what this place was or just mindlessly glued to the path. The hidden books became more and more clear directing him on a different path, ending back under the tree. This time, he noticed a secret door below the water. He wondered how he could have missed something so clear the last time he was here. He jumped into the water and dove down to the door. And upon entering, he found a book in the center of the room. This time, it wasn't hidden. The book explained that it can't see him down here, and that the castle can't be trusted. It said the castle wasn't telling the truth about the other travelers, and that he needed to find a way into the portal. All Carl could think about was what it might be, and what was really happening with the other versions of him. As he swam back up to the surface, he noticed something was different. Sat in a line were 13 books, each the exact same, telling him to stick to the path. He didn't know who to believe. On one hand, the in-between had been good to him, he felt happy and safe there. But were those feelings distracting him from the truth? And what lied on the other side of that portal? He made his way back down to the edge of the island, and staring off into the empty sky, he felt reality becoming clear as he was transported back to Kanoko Kingdom. But although he had left the in-between, it never left his mind. And Carl knew that no matter what happened in his next adventure, the next time he visited that place, he had to find a way through the portal. That day, the sun shined extra bright on the Seven Empire, as today was the day that a new general would be crowned. Carl found himself in the middle of the market, and was immediately approached by the Emperor Porcius VII, who, having never seen Carl, assumed he was there to film the Great Games. Having no idea what was going on, Carl played along and was led to the Colosseum by Porcius.
Porcius explained that today, there would be a great competition, where some of the most vicious gladiators in the land would battle to the death, or at least till someone was knocked out, and the winner would be crowned general of the empire. Next, the two made their way around the Colosseum, descending into the cellar to meet the gladiators. They traversed the dark halls of the cellar. Giant beasts sat caged ready to fight. Weapons lined the walls, and gladiators prepared to fight for their lives. Jackie, who'd been pulled from the street against his will. Lagius, self-proclaimed great gladiator. Bartholomew, who was very drunk. Watson, the best archer in the empire. Levi, experienced fighter since childhood. John, who is renamed Ugly by Porcius. Genevieve, ready to become the first female general of the empire. Ran, who was given the first round by because of his cool name. And Edward, who had always wanted to be general. Carl looked around. Of all these people, only one would be alive at the end of the day. Or at least not knocked out. But there was no time to sit and worry as Porcius explained that it was finally time for the Tournament of the Pit to begin. After countless battles and intense fighting, Jackie had prevailed as the greatest fighter in all the land. Porcius and Carl made their way to the pit, and there, Jackie would be crowned general of the Southern Empire. But Porcius explained there was one more test Jackie needed to pass. One final test of his spirit and tolerance for war. In each of their battles, the loser had only been knocked unconscious. But, Porcius explained, if Jackie really wanted to become general, he had to kill them. Every last one. Everyone stood silent, waiting for someone to make the first move. But then, the real war began. Carl and Porcius made their way across the pit, and over to Jackie. It was there where he was officially declared general of the great Subban Empire. The crowd roared in excitement as Carl handed the Emperor his camera to show him the footage of the day's event. But as he examined the footage, he realized that Carl had forgotten to take the lens cap off the camera and nothing had been recorded. Infuriated. Porcius ordered the general to execute Carl. Carl ran, making it all the way to the stands of the Colosseum before stopping. He felt the world begin to fade away, 
and as Jackie lunged towards Carl with his netherite sword, Carl closed his eyes as the deafening roars of the crowd and scorching heat of the pit gave way to the eerie quiet of the in-between. Right away, something felt different, like the whole castle was turning against him. Welcome back. So much has happened all around the world since you've been here. There is so much to learn about yourself. I see you have accidentally strayed from the path recently, and I must remind you, don't stray from the path. He felt out of control, like his mind was pulling him in two different directions, and at any given moment, the switch would flip the other- Notice you strayed a bit from the path there. Your mind seems to be playing tricks on you. Let's not let that happen again. It happened again. The in-between felt like a virus, spreading to every corner of his mind. He had to fight back. He had to get to the poor- Stop straying from the path, Carl. I know you more than you do. I know what is right for you. These visions should not dictate your opinion on the in-between. It is safe here. It wasn't safe here. He needed to find a way out before it was too late. Don't go to the portal. I will see to it that you regret it if you do so. This is not a warning. We will come and make sure you don't stray from the path. The world spun around him. Time jumped back and forth. He was out of control. Until he saw the torches. Something was leading him down another path. And having no other choice, Carl placed his trust in blind faith and followed the torches to the portal. sides clashed in his mind. Should he go? Should he stay? He looked over the in-between one last time, praying that whatever lied on the other side could save him, end this chaos for good, make him feel safe again. And as he stepped into the portal, he remembered his friends. All of them, from every time and place he'd ever been. One last time, in case he would never remember again. <laughs>